beginning and no end. You're my hope and my defense. You came to see and save the lost. You paid it all upon the cross. You are stronger. You are stronger. Sin is broken. You have saved me. It is written. Christ is risen. Jesus, you are Lord of all. Good morning, Clear Creek. We welcome you here. If you're with us for the first time, you're especially welcome. We hope you'll be back with us often as you possibly can. If you're going to follow along in your Bibles this morning, which I always suggest that you do because I make these slides and I can put anything up there I want to. So you might want to know what the Bible really says and follow along in Daniel chapter 3 this morning. Daniel chapter 3, that's where we're going to take our text for our lesson today. A lot of good things going on at Clear Creek, and we're about to enter into a time of year where this church really rallies together, and we're generous. We reach out to our, our neighborhood, and we want to encourage you to be a part of those things. But before we do that, we also have some families who've decided that they would like to be a part of the Clear Creek family. Um, I haven't seen these people here this morning, but they told me they'd be here this week. Uh, Terry and Patty Anderson and Olivia have placed membership with our congregation. If Terry and Patty are in here, I want to ask them to stand. Are they here? There they are. Okay. We are so glad that you're a part of this family, and we want to just say welcome home. We're glad you're here. Also, we have another couple and, and their family, um, Brian and Katie Adams, and, and their children have decided to be a part of this congregation. Brian and Katie, where are you? Please stand. <clears throat> Once again, welcome home. We are so glad that y'all decided to be a part of the Clear Creek family. I look forward to seeing what God is going to do through your family and how we are going to be able to be a stepping stone for you as well uh, as we lock arms in order to reach out into the world and, and to make disciples of men, introducing them to Jesus. Uh, also, we want to uh, remind you, and you'll get a reminder at the end of the lesson as well, that... Uh, as you go out, there will be people holding grocery bags, and they'll have a list on the side, and that is for us to put together our Thanksgiving baskets uh, that we'll be giving out to people in our community who are, are in need and need some help during the Thanksgiving holidays. And I tell you what, I want to challenge this congregation that we're going to take all of those bags that you bring down here, we're going to put them on the stage, and let's cover this stage up. I'll, I'll preach from down there if you want me to. I'll stand on a ladder. Let's cover the stage up. We'll do whatever we can to do that. Uh, but that bag, the way it starts is pick up one of those bags, go to the grocery store, fill it up, bring it down, and I can't wait to see what we're able to do and help some people in our community who are truly needy. Last thing I want to say before we begin our lesson <clears throat> is that we're at a crucial time for our country. We live in a great nation, and uh, we have an opportunity this week to, to vote for the leader of our land. I want to encourage everyone to do that. I think that as Christians, that it is our obligation and our duty and our blessing to live in a place like this and to take part in that process. So I want to encourage everyone to do that. But I also want to say this. As you do that, vote your conscience in the Bible, not your wallet. We do that so many times when we think about the economy. Vote the way that you think God would want this country to be led. So you think that whoever that is, I don't care who you vote for, you vote for whoever you want to, but remember to vote your conscience. And, and having said that, let's pray together and pray for our country, pray for this election, and pray for our family. God, we come before you this morning so grateful that we have an amazing opportunity. The opportunity is not to vote. The opportunity is to come here today and to commune with you and with one another. We recognize that this is the only place that we can do this. That the church is where you have come and, and said, come together, lock arms, worship me. And Lord, when, when we do that, when we truly worship you, your spirit works in us in incredible and amazing ways. And Father, this morning as we worship together, we pray that you will lift us up and that we will come away from here knowing that you are the only God that is living, the only one who is worthy of praise. We know that sometimes life is hard. 
And sometimes life is difficult, and we always face those fires. But we know we never face them alone. We thank you for that. We thank you for your son, for we're only as clean as the cross was bloody. We thank you for the forgiveness that comes in that. And we praise your name because of the sacrifices made for us. Thank you for being a God who'd rather die than live without us. And it's in your son's name we offer this prayer. And amen. You know, life is tough. And, and our, our sermon topic today is walking through life's fire without going up in flames. And I know that's a long title, but I have a funny feeling that when you read that title, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> life can be difficult. It can be difficult on the very best of days. There, there are things in life that we know are always true. And there are things that will create fires in our life, these fires that make living kind of difficult. You know, one of those things is that when things just don't turn out the way you think they should, e either something has happened in your life that you think, I didn't expect that coming, or something's happened in your life, you're thinking, how could God let this happen? And we sometimes forget that he causes all things, good and bad, to work together for good for those who love him are called according to his purpose. So sometimes things just don't turn out the way we want. Second thing is, you know, sometimes life's fires come from people just don't like you. I mean, you didn't expect to hear that from the pulpit, did you? You know what? It's, a, it's, it's been kind of scientifically proven. Actually, it's been scientifically proven that if you start a sentence with scientifically proven, everybody will believe it. <laughs> but it's been scientifically proven that no matter who you are, the average person, one in ten people, will not like you no matter what you do or what you say. They're just not going to like you. So look around you. Pick out who it is. No, I'm just kidding. Um, one in ten people are not going to like you. And there's always going to be someone that doesn't like you. And there are always repercussions that, that come from that. The other thing, when we're Christians and we're living for our God in this world, we recognize this, and this is another one of life's fires, and that is truly honoring God brings about persecution. If you don't believe that, you go to the Sermon on the Mount and look in Matthew chapter 5, and you read, blessed are those who are persecuted. And he goes on and says, blessed are those who suffer all kinds of evil for my name. Guys, I tell you what, if you're truly a Christian, you will suffer some sort of persecution. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But if you're truly a Christian, you're going to suffer. You're going to walk through life's fires. It's going to happen. And if it hasn't happened to you yet, <laughs> fasten your chin strap jacket's coming. And so this morning's lesson is really about how to face life's fires, no matter what they are, whether it's the unexpected or something outside of your control or whether it's a challenge to your faith, whatever it is, how do you start and finish in facing those fires? And a great story in Scripture is one that you're probably all familiar with. It's in the book of Daniel chapter 3. It's the story of three men called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And those are really weird names we'll talk about in a minute. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were about to suffer a great challenge. A challenge to them personally, a challenge to their faith, from a king of Babylon named Nebuchadnezzar. So if you would, let's read together in the book of Daniel, chapter 3. We're going to read, kind of go through this story a little bit, leading up to verse 16. And we're going to start in verse 1. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide, which is 90 feet by 9 feet, by the way. And it's set up on a plain in Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, if you go down to, to verse 3, because it kind of skips some things that, you, that are there, read them, but... Don't really plan the story. It says, And all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. All these officials, all the people that had been a part of his administration. And then the, the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Now, before we go any further, how many of you have even heard of this story? It's okay to raise your hand in church. Have you heard of this story? Okay, good. So, so most of you are familiar with this story. Nebuchadnezzar had set up this huge idol, this god. 
And after he had set up this huge idol, 90 feet tall by 9 feet wide, really what he was doing is he was trying to see who would worship him. But he set up the, this idol in his place, and he got all these people together, and he says, here's what I want you to do. We're going to play some music, and I want you to all bow down before this idol and pay homage to this God who we know is really not a God at all, right? And, and, and so he says this, and then he says another thing, which I love, I love what he does here, because he gives them an or else. You know, if it was really a God, you'd think they'd want to bow down to it, but he gave them an or else. You know what? If you don't bow down to the God, see that furnace over there we make bricks out of? <laughs> you're going to get to dance in the middle of it until you're dead. That's what he's saying here. And so he gives this decree, and they go through all the gyrations that are a part of it, and a problem arises. And that brings us to verse 12. And in verse 12, the Bible tells us this. It says, uh, there were some of the people that were part of these uh, officials of the provinces came to him and said, there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you. Your majesty, they, they neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Problem. He had people that he had entrusted to rule over the affairs, uh, some important affairs in his nation, and he had told them to bow before this idol, and they absolutely refused to do so. So, remember, we had an or else, right? If you didn't bow down, you're going to go stand in the fire. But because he revered these three young men, and we'll talk about why, but he really revered these three young men, we pick up in the next verse, and going through verse 15, we find out that he's going to give them one more chance. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I had to practice those names, by the way, uh, that, you not, uh, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of God that I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound, basically, once again, one more choice. Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace Check out what he says next, because this is where he took a shot at them that they weren't going to take. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? See what's happening here? Oh, he sets up this fake God. He tells everybody to bow to it. They don't do it. He brings it to them. So I'm going to give you one more chance, but let me put it this way. That's God. Your God's not God. Did you catch that? So guys, when we're faced with life's fires and we're set up in a position where we have to make hard choices in our life, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we have to be able to give an answer. And so today I'm going to talk about two or three things. This is your lesson after that. Go home, study it. And if you want to argue with me about it later, give me a call. I won't argue with you, but we'll discuss. They take a step, a very important step, and it's in verse 16. They understand point one, and that is we must obey God and his commands rather than man's expectations. Okay? We must obey God's commands rather than men's expectations. When you start facing a fire, start it by saying this, what does God want me to do? Not what does men expect, what, what do men expect me to do? Look in verse 16 with me. Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, look at this, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Love it. Here's what they've done. Th they have gone back to this king who said, you can either bow down or I'm going to burn you alive. And they said this, you don't understand. I don't have a relationship with that 90-foot tall, 9-foot wild thing. See, I've got a relationship with God, and it's one of them A-B relationships. And, Neb, you can, see your, you can see your way out of that. We don't have to defend ourselves for you because you are not anyone to us. And you can imagine how that stung Nebuchadnezzar. 
Now, you have to understand some of the history to really understand how that really got under his craw because we know what happens. He heats that oven up seven times hotter than it was ever heated. The people that will take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the fire, they die before they can even get them there. This guy's pretty hot under the collar about it, but here's why. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon that had taken over the Israelites. They were slaves to Babylon. The northern kingdom had been taken years before, but now the southern kingdom had been taken over under the rule of Jehoiakim. And what they had done was uh, Nebuchadnezzar decided that he would destroy Israel in two ways. Number one, the, the descendants of Jehoiakim, who were not considered, and I love this part, good-looking and intelligent, I guess I would have been in this other group, uh, the ones who weren't good-looking and intelligent, he made them eunuchs so that they would never be able to produce an heir to the throne. The rest of them, he decides he's going to do this. He is going to bring them into his culture, and he is going to do three things. Now, you can go back and read Daniel chapter 1. It's all in there. There are four guys that are a part of this good-looking, intelligent group. Their names are Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah later will have their names changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he takes these people, and what he does is he says, I am going to educate you for three years. Not just education, the finest education. You're going to learn about the arts of the Babylonians. You're going to learn about the culture of the Babylonians. And you're going to learn about the gods of the Babylonians. You're going to be so educated. It's going to be amazing. And then the next thing he does is he says, I'm going to feed you the best food in the land. You go back and look, and he gives them the richest food and the best of wine. And this, this good-looking, intelligent heirs to the throne of Jehoiakim, who were descendants of Hezekiah, he is going to take them. He's going to educate them. He's going to make him one of them. He's going to take them. He's going to give them the best of the food. And, and then the next thing we find out, if you go down a little further, he changes their names. Oh, you know, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, th those are... Those are Israel names. You need a name where you're going to really fit in. We're going to call you Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. Now, what you don't realize on first glance is that in the Bible, names mean something. And every one of those names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were homages to Jehovah God Almighty. They meant God is faithful, God will provide. All of those, that's what those names meant. The names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego paid homage to Babylonian gods, the God of the sun, the God of the moon, and the God of the earth. And so what he had done is he had changed their names from paying homage to that God to this God. And you know how he was persecuting these people up to this point? He wasn't persecuting them by doing horrible things to them. This group of men, he was persecuting them with comfort. Here's his plan. I'm going to give them the best of the education. I'm going to teach them a better way. I'm going to give them the best food. I'm going to make them wealthy. I'm going to allow them to fit into culture. And you know what? After a while, they're going to start seeing things my way. Because, you know, they worship the God that let them go into slavery. They'll see things my way. And you give me two or three generations... They'll forget all about this God. Does any of that sound familiar to you? Do we not live in a country that honors education above all? Do we not live in a country that, that pays particular attention to the good-looking and the intelligent? Do we not live in a country to where we have more than we would ever need? And we continue to get more on top of that? Do we not live in a country where our children are more, more excited about fitting in than they are about being different? They're more excited about, about the relationships they have with everyone else than the relationship they have with God. Does, that, does any of this make sense? Does this, are you following me here? And I'm telling you that if we don't go back and understand that we have to obey God first above all else, give us three generations and they will not know who Jehovah God is. I know you didn't come to hear that, but it's the truth. If we continue to allow persecution of the church through comfort, 
where we have more than we need and more is never going to be enough. And we continue to create beasts in our life that cannot be fed, the beasts of wealth and education and knowledge and culture. When we keep bringing those beasts in our life that can't be fed, guess what's going to happen? It's not going to be long before we forget who God is. And we're going to worship a false god. And they knew it. If you go back to Daniel chapter 1 and look at verse 8, look at what Daniel says. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now I want you to look at one word in there. It was defile. It wasn't, Daniel decided he'd just rather do the old food. He kind of liked herbs and vegetables. No. He understood that to do what he was being asked to do would defile him. And he and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, looked at this persecution through comfort. And they said, that worm's got a hook in it. Something's not right. And they would not fall prey to the tricks of Nebuchadnezzar. And so we lead up here, and he's saying, hey, we don't have to defend you. We don't have to feel like I defend ourselves in front of you because, king, you're nobody. I remember another instance like this in the book of Acts, chapter 5. Uh, the disciples have been put into prison in, in, in the book of Acts. In verse 27 and 29, leading up to this, they've been put into prison for preaching the name of Jesus. They've been let out of the prison. The first thing they do is what? They preach Jesus. And so they're brought back before the Sanhedrin. It says, the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. He said, and you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. You want to know what the first step is in going through life's fires and being able to deal with whatever's coming your way? The first step is to say God is God and everybody else is not. And it's my obligation that no matter what happens in my life, I have to honor God first. Okay? God is God. And everybody else is not. And then we get into a value. If, if the next point I've got is we have to recognize that believing God not is just different than, but is more powerful than believing in God. Now you go back to the book of Daniel chapter 3. Look at verses 17 and 18. They, first off, they said, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, you're nobody. God is everything. We don't have to defend ourselves. We're going to obey God and not you. But then the next thing he says is, we believe God. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Then in verse 18... Even if he does not, look at that close, even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty and we'll not serve your God or worship the image of gold you've set up. Man, you're talking about courage. Not only were they saying, you know what, we're going to obey God no matter what, but we want you to know we believe God. We know what he's taught. We know where we are. We know all the circumstances around us. And God is still God, and I still believe in his promises. Period. That takes courage. And then they go and say, but you know what? Even if he doesn't rescue us from this fire, I want to let you know something, Nebuchadnezzar. There are things in life that are worse than dying. Let that one soak in. There are things in this life that are worse than dying, and not having God is at the top of that list. You want to know how to face life's fires with courage? You come to the understanding that you're going to obey God and you're going to believe God rather than just believe in God. You have a lot more courage. And you know what? You can go, to, you can go before whatever is happening to you and you can say this. There are things in life that are worse than dying. There is nothing you can do to defeat me. Because I have victory in my God. 
And if I made a list of all the things in life that are worse than dying, not having God would be at the top of that list. And we get to that point, we won't have to worry about a lot of the decisions that we have to make in our lives. Those decisions will be incredibly clear. The book of James. James writes these words in, in James chapter 2, verse 19. He, he says, you believe that there's one God. Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. You know, here's what's happening with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The difference between believing God and believing in God is that believing, God, believing in God is just a, a head faith. Believing God is a heart faith. It, it, it's, a cata, it, it's a catalytic faith. See, the demons believe in God, and it changes them zero. They're still demons. But for us... If we want to face life's fires, we can't just believe in God. We have to have a belief and a faith that changes us. If you actually turn in your Bible over to James chapter 2 and you looked at the verse before, James is talking about the difference of faith and works. So you show me your faith. Without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. And what he's saying is this. You know what? I believe and my belief has changed me. And it's changed the way I attack everything around me. You want to face life's fires? Start with, I have to obey God. You know, if you want a real definition of, of catalytic faith, it's in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. This is a verse of Scripture that's familiar to all of you, I'm sure. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Look at this next line. But only the ones who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You've got two guys standing here in front of a fiery furnace. A king who's red in the face angry. He's going to throw them in. And they're saying, you know what? I'm going to obey God rather than you. And I think my God can deal with this no matter what. Paul's words in that was, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. When we have that attitude, life's fires are not nearly as hot. And the next thing I want to show you is this. That all real faith, realize that all real faith is always tested. But the truly faithful are never alone. Real faith will always be tested. You're going to always have an opportunity to exercise real faith. And there are going to be times when it's going to be difficult and the fires are going to be hot. But I want to encourage you by saying this. You will never, ever go it alone. As you know, the story goes, the fire was set seven times hotter than ever. And uh, the, the men leading... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the fire. They threw them in. They died. It was so hot. And then an amazing thing happens. We, we, we pick up verses 24 and 25. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that were tied up and thrown in the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed and the fourth looks like a son of the gods and you look at that that statement the son of the gods it's because Nebuchadnezzar didn't know God but he knew something special was going on there something incredible was happening there that these three men Hananiah Michelle and Azariah who he had renamed and tried to reculture stood up for their God, and their God stood up for them. I want to assure you by letting you know, it may not work out the way you want it to work out. Not everybody's going to like you. And yeah, if you're faithful, you'll be persecuted. You'll be tested with your faith. But when you go through that fire, there's going to be somebody else in that fire with you. You're never alone. 
If you look at the very last thing that Jesus said to his disciples, he gave the Great Commission in, in the book of Matthew, chapter 28. And we, we, I've talked quite a bit about, you know, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. But the very last thing he says is this, and surely I am with you always. Always. To the very end of the age. You go back to Daniel chapter 3, verse 28. This had an amazing effect on Nebuchadnezzar. It said, Nebuchadnezzar then said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. And he goes on and says, Therefore I decree that the people of any nation who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego <laughs> will be cut into pieces. Their houses will turn into a pile of rubble for no other God can save in this way. Whoa, what a story. What a story. Obey God. Have a faith that is catalytic and changes you and the things around you. And realize you're not in this thing alone. You're just not. But you know what? We've all got a choice. We all have an opportunity to exercise our faith. And when we stand before this fire, we have to ask ourselves, is being without God worse than dying? And I believe it is. In the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 24 and 25, the Bible says this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, uh, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for me will find it. We will never be fit to go through life's fires unless we are first willing to risk it all so that we can have God. This morning, ask yourself this. If I had to lose everything, and still have God. Now, I'm not asking you to do that, but I'm asking you to consider it. If I had to lose everything and still had God, would that be enough? For these three, it was. And it was the power that walked them through a fire. Because when you can answer yes to that question, Your priorities will change. When you answer yes to that question, your commitment level rises. When you answer yes to that question, 90% of these troubling decisions in life become incredibly clear. I want to encourage all of us to be people who obey God rather than men. I want to encourage us to all be people who have a faith that is Catalytic. We believe God. We don't just believe in God. And we need to be people who realize that we're not in this alone. Let's pray together. God, you're an awesome God. I thank you for this morning. I pray that uh, uh, this lesson has been one that will honor you and will lift these people up and will challenge us. So we live in a nation that is being persecuted by comfort. And Lord, we pray that we'll understand that sometimes enough is enough and that we have to honor you in the decisions that we make and the way we live our lives. Father, we know that you sent manna in the wilderness, and the rules of manna were very simple. You take what you need, and if you take more than that, blessing becomes a curse. And it's the same way in our lives today. We pray that we'll be people who are satisfied with, with the blessings that you give us and that we'll honor you with whatever you send our way because you are the God who causes all things to work together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Strengthen this church, strengthen this family. 
And we pray that we honor you in the name of your son, Jesus. And amen. There may be one or more that loves the Lord and you've not taken up your cross to follow him. We want to invite you to do that. If you'd like the prayers of the church, we would love to pray with you. We love you and care about your soul. We want to be in heaven with you. If you'd like to begin your journey with Jesus Christ, we, we believe here that you do that through baptism, an outward uh, expression of your faith that Jesus was, he lived, he died, and he was raised from the dead. And because of that, we will be too someday. Also, our elders will be in room, say, five and a seven across the hall to minister to you individually if you require that. We want to help you. We're here to encourage you. Whatever we can do, we invite you to come. While we stand and sing to encourage you. My heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares to your